Welcome to this IQ seminar. Let us start. Today I will talk to you about how to improve indoor air quality for well-being and invigoration. My name is Leo Schuler, owner of ProAce. Recent challenges in the industry, you might be aware are like Legionella, SARS, MERS, or COVID, which keeps us on our toes right now. And the question is, what will be the next pandemic facing, we have to face? However, I would like to look at the permanent challenges we face, like insufficient indoor air quality, unhappy clients, excessive sick leave, and very high running costs inside the buildings. When we look at the life cycle cost of a building, like design, construction, running costs, inhabitants, decommissioning, which is the highest cost? Well, it's not the running cost, it's the cost for the staff. This is very important. If we keep the staff or the guests happy, we have a much better outcome than if we try to save a little bit of energy cost. So coming to the sick building syndrome, these are the side causes by Diana Driscoll. She's a very renowned doctor. The main issue is the inadequate ventilation because we like to save energy by using less outdoor air. However, there is a cost to this. We have a problem with chemical contaminants like VOCs from cleaning agents, etc. Chemical contaminants from outdoor sources, from motor vehicles, from nearby industry, or plumbing vents. We have biological contaminants, like we're talking about COVID. So bacteria, molds, pollen, and viruses are affecting us every day. The main pollutants of the air as an engineer, I look from the practical side. We normally have issues with bacteria, maybe with tobacco smoke, with viruses, molds, and we have to solve these issues with the lowest possible cost and the highest possible outcome. As you know, the common methods to clean the air are by using dilution. So with dilution, we can remove odors and smells and replace it with fresh air. We use mechanical filters, we can use adsorption filters like activated carbon or absolute filters like HEPA filters. The issue with these uh, filters are the high energy effort required to condition the outdoor air. So if we bring in fresh air, we have to normally cool it and humidify it. We have high pressure losses through these filters, high replacement cost, areas of bacterial growth, and we have low performance when the humidity is high. So in the Middle East, during summer, the humidity is always very high when we have to cool down the air. So how does nature clean the air? The sun is very important because it creates UV light, which kills bacteria and pollutants. Forests take in polluted air and release fresh air and fresh oxygen. Rainfall is like a wash. So the same principle like nature uses is used to improve indoor air quality. And it was discovered by Einstein and Habicht. Because Einstein was living in Switzerland at that time, he went to the basement. He could experience this stale, depressing air. And he climbed some mountains. And he could experience the invigorating properties of the fresh air. And he figured out that it has to do with activated oxygen. So if, we, if, the, if the oxygen is activated, is alive, we feel alive. If there's no activated oxygen, we feel depressed. He built some cleaning appliances, which were very effective, but they were also unsafe because he could not control the output of ozone. And he learned that activated oxygen has to be produced on site. It cannot be stored in a bottle. And this system is very efficient to neutralize pollutants that bypass a mechanical filter. <clears throat> so how do we stop microbials entering a building or being spread in a building? There's lots of good research from the last couple of years. So the bacteriocidical actions of positive and negative ions, how the oxygen activates formulations to disinfect or sterilize, how a small amount of ozone will inactivate enterovirus, etc. I have these um, reports. If you like them, send me an email. So how do we work inside the space? How do we improve your air quality? This is your space. It could be a ballroom. It could be 
a hotel lobby, it could be an airport terminal. This is the fresh air handling unit or air handling unit, supply air duct, return air duct. We might have recirculation. By adding an ionization stage, so-called bipolar ionization stage, into the last stage of the air handling unit or inside the supply air duct, we start the activation process. If the process is very dynamic, we can use more sensors to totally understand what's happening. So we can see the air quality entering the space and also the air quality uh, being returned from the space. So the first stage is the pollutants are neutralized after the ionization stage inside the supply air duct. The second stage, the ionized air continues to attack the pollutants inside the space where they occur. If somebody eats fish or smokes a cigarette, the air is still activated and it can react immediately. We don't have to bring the air to the filter stage. We bring the filter action inside the space. So the effects are that pollutants are neutralized at the point of treatment. Anti-activated oxygen continues to neutralize the surrounding air inside the space. So unlike a local filter, the two-stage process neutralizes pollutants where they occur. Of course, you have to use sensors and a controller to keep the process at the sweet spot, basically to avoid too much ozone. It's very important. We need a technological solution to run the system at sweet spot. Then the result will be that we have invigorating air as intended by nature, just like Einstein uh, figured out 100 years ago. So the benefits are substantial indoor air quality improvements because we reduce and neutralize pollutants and we inactivate virus and bacteria. Plus we have the energy savings. Because we increase the air quality, we can lower the outer air. And the optimization is possible between these two, depending on the customer requirement. In the Middle East, we have done some installations where we were able to lower the fresh air proportion from 100% to 50%. Meanwhile, we save the odor issues. That means the load on the chiller will be lowered by more than 50%, which is amazing. It's basically a license to print money. Another real world study, the influence of CO2 levels and TVOC levels on humans. Because when I talk about allowing higher CO2 levels in the building, people always reply to me and say, well, people get, get tired, it won't be okay. Well, here's a good study. And in this study, we studied the effect of wearing CO2 and TVOC on personal doing standardized tasks. There are 24 participants doing standardized tasks. And you see the cubicles here and you see the air supply where they could change the, the VOC content and CO2 content for each of the cubicles. So the results, the influence of CO2 on cognitive function. Looking at these graphs, you see, for example, basic activity level, the X axis is the CO2 content. The y-axis is the function score. You see the basic activity level drops a little bit with higher CO2. Looking at the task orientation, there's very little difference with higher CO2. Looking at crisis response, it's quite interesting that some people at, at 1,000 ppm of CO2, they actually work better than at 500 ppm. Information seeking, there's not much happening. So if we look at the influence of VOC levels on the cognitive output, <clears throat> we have a conventional building where the VOC is 550. As you know, the limit mandated by the government is 2000 micrograms per cubic meter. So 550 is still very low. We have a green building with 350. We have a green building with green plus building where it's below 50. And if you look at this, uh, functions course, basic activity level, you see the output gets better in the green plus building. So where the VOC is lower, the function score is better. On all of these tasks, especially information usage, our output, the brain output gets much better if the air quality is better. So the findings are that higher CO2 level has an influence on some abilities, 
but not on others. So there's no clear trend. In fact, as you know, a welder in a welding bay, he can work at the max concentration of 5,000 ppm for eight hours. So it seems while our body is active, the CO2 doesn't matter too much. However, at night to relax and refresh the body, we need to have lower CO2 content. Higher TVSD levels always lead to reduced cognitive disabilities, especially strategy or crisis response. So the elevated TVSD levels, they're still within the guidelines. They have a considerable negative influence on us. So the take home message is that insufficient indoor air quality is the main cause of sick building syndrome. And we have a large cost penalty because we have loss of work performance. In Germany, where the unions are very strong, if they're not happy with the workplace and they feel they get sick or have a headache, they will immediately take sick leave. And of course, it's very costly. Post COVID, the control of microbials is becoming state of the art. So more and more building operators are compelled to add more security to have the best possible building and to keep people happy and healthy. VOCs and odors have the largest influence on well-being and productivity. If we reduce the VOCs through design, like low emitting furnishings, low emitting cleaning agents, and neutralizing the VOCs with active systems such as bipolarization, we have a much better air quality. And if we achieve this much better air quality, we can, we can uh, reduce the amount of fresh air to save energy, which means we can have energy savings and the improved indoor air quality at the same time. I thank you for listening and I look forward to your questions during the Q&A session. Thank you and goodbye.